A bloody encounter between a Confederate officer and a Federal soldier on Jimmy's Creek by S.C. Turnbow Among the rough, steep hills and deep hollows of Sister Creek, on the south side of the White River in Marion County, Arkansas, lives Joe Pace. He's the son of Carl and Mary M. Pace, and Joe was born on Jimmy's Creek, October 17, 1853. Now, Mr. Carl Pace settled a claim on Jimmy's Creek, one mile above the mouth of Wildcat Creek, where Joe Pace was born. Joe's parents both have passed over the great beyond, and their bodies rest in the same graveyard near Wildcat Schoolhouse on Jimmy's Creek. Joe Pace is a proprietor of Pace's Ferry on the White River, just above the mouth of Sister Creek and four miles below the little town of Oakland. Mr. Joe Pace relates the following war story, which he says is strictly true. My father, Carl Pace, was a captain of a company in the 14th Confederate Arkansas Infantry. My mother was a sister of Tomps McCracken and the daughter of Joe McCracken. In the month of August, 1863, Jimmy's Creek was invaded for the first time by a small command of Federal troops of mounted men. Now, my father was at home on leave of absence. Jim Skinner was then living in the Van Lance Place on the south bank of the river just above the mouth of Sister Creek. This man had observed the Federals passing down the river on the north side where the old John Pearson farm is. Mr. Skinner set about at once to give warning of the approach of the Federals to the few settlers who lived on Jimmy's Creek and the other settlements towards Yellville, for the river was at low stage and easily forded. So, mounting a horse, he galloped down the mouth of Sister Creek before the Federals reached the ford there and up that stream a short distance over the dividing ridge to Jimmy's Creek, then up the water course to where my father lived above the mouth of Wildcat. Mr. Skinner arrived at our house and the strength of his horse was entirely exhausted and his body was covered with sweat and foam. As the man approached the house, he hallooed to father, Captain Pace, the feds are coming, and I've come to warn you of their approach. My horses give out, and I cannot ride him any further. Now, Mr. Skinner now abandoned the horse and ran into the brush to hide from the enemy. And father hastily caught a bay mule he called Jack, and mounted him and urged him into a gallop to notify his neighbors of the coming enemy. Now it seems that the Federals had seen Mr. Skinner galloping down the river on the south side and believing that he was intending to give the settlers warning of their approach, they pushed across the river and followed the fresh trail of Skinner's horse as rapidly as their horses could travel. Now about the time my father got out of their sight, we seen the Federal galloping up the road toward the house with a pistol in his hand. The man galloped on by the house without halting or asking a question and followed the same road that my father had just gone over. Now, When my father had galloped the mule near a half a mile up the creek or just below where Kingdom Spring is, now he heard the horse's feet coming up behind him. And he stopped and turned the mule across the road to wait and see if it was a friend getting out of the way of the enemy. Well, in a few moments, the horseman come into view and it proved to be an armed Federal who was only a few yards from him. Now, my father had his pistol buckled around him, but he made no attempt to draw the weapon from the scabbard, but waited until the Federal soldier had galloped up to him with a pistol in hand. Now, the Federal made no effort to use the pistol nor ask my father to surrender, Neither did he ask him if he was armed. But when the Federal reached him, he stopped and says, You've gone far enough in this direction. Well, says my father, which way do you want me to go? Well, let's go back the other way, replied the man in blue. Very well. Turn your horse in the way you desire to go, said father. 
and the Federal, who was still holding the pistol in his hand, reined his horse around and started back down the creek. My father never moved until the Federal got a few yards off, and then he jerked his pistol from the scabbard and shot the Federal and wounded him, causing the man in blue to jerk both of his feet out of the stirrups. And without turning in his saddle, he placed the pistol underneath his arm in the muzzle pointing toward my father and fired a shot at random and immediately urged his horse into a gallop down the creek. Now father shot at the Federal twice more before he got beyond his view. The ball from the pistol in the hands of the Federal struck father in the thigh. The wounded Federal galloped back to our house where he met his command which had just arrived and he says to them, Boys, I'm shot. And the Federals ask him, Did you hit him? I don't know, he said, but go on and if you can find him, give him hell. And they all started up the road the way the wounded man had come. My father knew that the Federals would make an effort to hunt him down and decided it would be best to dismount, leave the mule, and seek a place of safety among the crags and cliffs along the creek. But after he got off the mule, he discovered that the ball shot at him by the Federal had broke his thigh and he could neither walk nor remount the mule again. He was suffering intense pain and the wound was bleeding freely. He was in a helpless condition and powerless to get out of the way on foot, but he must make an effort to leave the road, and leaving the mule standing in the road, he crawled forty yards to a shelving rock which lay close to the ground, where just barely enough room for him to crawl under it. He had just got under the rock and was suffering an agony of pain when he heard the clattering of a number of horses' feet over the stony ground coming up the road. Well, it proved to be a body of Federal cavalry, and they soon reached the mule, which by this time they had got out of the road and was grazing. One of the troopers dismounted and tried to catch the mule, but his mule ship refused to be friendly and started off down Father's trail where he had pulled himself along to the cliff. And as he went along, he would put his nose down to the ground and smell where Father had crawled along. The commander of the troops says, Oh, that dang mule! Shoot it down! Let us push on! The man who was trying to catch the mule answered, Go ahead! I'll catch the mule and overtake you! And while the man was falling on behind the mule, trying to coax it to stop, the mule walked up six feet of the ledge rock where father was under, and knowing if the Federal saw him, he would shoot him instantly. My father made ready to defend himself the best he could. Two barrels of his revolver were loaded, and he cocked the pistol and aimed it at the man with the intention of shooting him if the man discovered him. Though suffering terrible pain from his broken thigh, yet he held the pistol on the Federal, who was so busy in trying to catch the mule that he never discovered father, nor heard the click of the pistol. Directly, the man succeeded in catching the mule and led him back to the road, and remounting his horse, he rode on to the direction his friends had went, leading the mule at the side of his horse. This was at two o'clock in the afternoon, and my mother, not knowing that father was hurt and supposing he had escaped, and she concluded it was best to get off the public road where we lived, and she took us children, which was seven in number, and went to a relative of ours of the name of Bill King, who lived off the public highways one and one-half miles from our house. Now, on the following day at 10 a.m., I took one of our horses into the woods and hobbled him to prevent the Federals from capturing him. Just as I had finished tying the rope around his legs and rose to my feet, I heard my father call me, and I answered and ran to him. When I reached the spot where he lay wounded and very weak, I was horrified to find him in such a terrible condition. The first words he said to me after I got to him was, Joe, is the feds gone yet? And I replied, Yes, father, they are all gone as far as I know. My father had crawled one mile and a half from where he was shot and was almost perished for the want of water. He said he had not tasted a bit of water since he was wounded. He says, 
Joe, run to Bill's house and get me some water. I'm nearly starved for a drink. It was near 300 yards to Bill King's house, and I ran with all my might to tell my mother and Mr. King and his wife about father's helpless condition. Now, I took some water in the vessel and got back to father first. He wanted to drink all the water in the vessel, but I told him he was so nigh to starve to death for water that he only must drink a small quantity of water at a time, and it would not hurt him then, but if he drank it all at once, it'd kill him, and I would not let him only drink a little water until his great thirst was partially quenched. By this time, my mother and the other children, Mr. King and his family, got there and we went for other help immediately and made a litter of small poles and tacked it together and spread a quilt on it for a bed. And we lifted him up and put him on it and carried him three miles to a cliff rock in a wild and lonely looking place in a northwest direction from home where the star mine is now on Wildcat Creek and placed the suffering man in as comfortable position as circumstances would admit. Now my mother sent a runner to Yellville for two doctors, Job and Hansford, and they both come and dressed his wounds, and we all cared for him and gave him our best attention until he was able to be moved to a safer, more comfortable quarters. I and my mother was with him nearly all the time. It was two months before he was even able to travel. The wounded Federal was taken to my grandfather's, Joe McCracken, who lived on Jimmy's Creek below our house. On the night following the day the wounded Federal was carried there, a number of men collected at the cliff where we had carried my father on Wildcat Creek, and they wanted to go mob the wounded man in blue. Some say, hang him. Others wanted to shoot him. A few others said, let's stab him to death with knives. It seemed that the ill-fated soldier was doomed to die a cruel death. But my father, suffering the agonizing pains of dying, pled for the life of the Federal, and he finally prevailed on the mob to let the wounded soldier live and treat him well, and that he was wounded and in a helpless condition, and it was their duty to care for him in a merciful way, and when he was able to go, send him back to his friends and they all consented to do so, and they did treat him kindly, and and when he was able to travel, they sent him home. His name was Josephus Liverpool. Soon after the close of the war, he wrote a letter to my father, and father answered him. They carried on a friendly correspondence until Mr. Liverpool died. Then his father wrote to us several times afterward. They both died good friends to each other.